Welcome everyone to the site talk today. Um, so this one is going to be on uh, hoarding um, as a sort of continuation from our last one about OCD. Um, as always, um, I'll start with the, uh, <laughs> the disclaimer. So this talk is intended to provide uh, information and education only. Um, it's not meant for diagnostic or treatment purposes. Uh, just because you're experiencing some of the symptoms I'm going to talk about uh, doesn't mean you have um, a psychological disorder. Um, however, if you are experiencing distress uh, or are concerned uh, and want more information, please visit a health professional in your local area. That can be a doctor, a psychologist, psychiatrist, mental health nurse, uh, etc. So, uh, hoarding. Most of us will have heard the term. Uh, many of us will use the term in uh, our daily lives when we're um, talking about um, perhaps someone we know or even ourselves. Um, stocking up on items, um, being unwilling perhaps to let them go. Um, and that's okay. Um, the term hoarding doesn't necessarily refer to a uh, disorder or anything um, related to a mental illness. It can be used in um, uh, colloquial um, conversation to simply mean perhaps um, somebody who knows. Usually they have pretty good insight, right? Uh, somebody who knows that they are probably um, collecting or stocking up on items uh, a bit excessively. Um, now, uh, to go into a bit about maybe some terms that we often use, um, what is the difference between hoarding and collecting? So collectors, um, as, as we know, often look for specific items. Um, collection is usually done as a hobby. Uh, while some people would consider the things that are being collected uh, to be of low value or perhaps no value, um, usually the things that are collected are recognized at least by some particular group or some particular people as having material or sentimental value. So. You can think of, say, stamp collecting, uh, figurine collecting, uh, book collecting, uh, whatever it might be. Even somebody who, let's say, collects um, the teeth of their children, uh, you know, when they naturally fall out, um, as something of sentimental value that they can then show their children later on in perhaps a scrapbook or something like that. Um, that you know, we would judge that uh, as having some sentimental value. Um, with uh, hoarding, uh, often the items that are saved um, are saved excessively, and they're often items that uh, other people or society might view as uh, not worth much, or certainly not worth to the extent of uh, having that much of it. Um, often people who report problems with hoarding, um, the other end of it is very significant and ongoing difficulties parting with the possessions. So letting go of uh, items that you've acquired, that you've hoarded, um, tends to be met with significant uh, emotional difficulty, uh, maybe feelings of guilt, that sort of thing. Um, often the storage of these items also has a very negative impact on the person's life, um, so that the storage takes up uh, vast amounts of space uh, or vast amounts of expense. The storage might uh, start having... Um, an impact on uh, their ability to uh, clean uh, and you know, be a hygiene issue. 
So, and there's usually um, considerable problems with organization. So for a collector, you know, usually the items they collect are on display, uh, even if they're not, they're at least organized somewhere where they can be um, found uh, relatively easily by the collector. Um, so problems with organization in hoarding often lead to the point of um, people having difficulty moving around the house. Um, calls from neighbors uh, to say the council or police um, when the clutter starts extending outside the house. So sometimes that will be an issue. Um, it can lead to danger from things like falling uh, towers of paper or books. Um, and as I said, it can lead to hygiene issues. So what we are talking about when we start getting into um, these more serious symptoms, uh, these more serious issues that arise from excessive hoarding is what we would call uh, hoarding disorder or compulsive hoarding. Um, and, you know, there has been some awareness uh, generated by TV shows like uh, Hoarders. Um, and for better or worse, you know, that um, those shows, act, they do tend to actually, uh, in some cases, show realistic uh, what suffering from hoarding disorder might realistically look like. Um, of course, you know, they don't really focus on the mental health aspect of it, but um, it at least uh, shows people what um, the difference might be between someone who um, likes saving things and is sentimental about uh, past objects, um, for instance, compared with somebody who actually has compulsive hoarding or has hoarding disorder. So, hoarding disorders are generally characterized by collection of a lot of different items, um, and generally items that appear useless or of little value to most people. Right, and that's material value or sentimental value. Um, these items usually clutter living spaces and keep the person from using their rooms as they were intended. Um, and these things cause distress or problems in day-to-day -day activities. So, hoarding behaviours uh, can begin as early as in the teenage years, uh, for some people. Um, unfortunately, the average age of treatment uh, is around 40 to 50 years of age. So, you know, the, a lot of people go a long time before they seek treatment. Um, and, you know, that being the average age, some pe for some people it's in the you know, 60s, possibly 70s. Um, one of the big uh, differences with hoarding, um, as opposed to, say, uh, OCD. Um, so, OC, uh, hoarding used to be considered a type of OCD, uh, and it now has its own separate uh, diagnoses and separate section in the um, diagnostic manual. Um, now, people with OCD uh, more often than not have good insight. So they know that their compulsions and their obsessive thoughts um, over uh, intrusions are irrational, unreasonable. Um, so more often than not, people with OCD will realize that um, although they may not be able to stop those behaviors anyway. One of the big problems with hoarding is uh, most often people don't have insight. So more often than not, people will not have insight or good insight. Um, which means it's very difficult to convince somebody uh, who, even though, you know, for um, somebody going into their house, uh, perhaps we could see that the house is, you know, terribly cluttered, um, very disorganized, and most of the clutter is uh, what we would consider trash or garbage. Um, it's very difficult to convince that person to let that go um, because the insight 
more often than not is quite poor into the fact that they have a problem in the first place. Um, because of the uh, sort of um, characteristics of the condition, often hoarders will live alone um, or they may live with family but in very separate space to others or they may live with family and have taken over all of the spaces. Um, and the prevalence is around 1-2% to um, of the population. So it's not huge, but it's also not nothing. Um, so, you know, that's 1 in 50 to 1 in 100 people. Um, the, the thing is, compulsive courting, the development of it is quite complex, and a lot of research is still going on as to... Um, why people might develop it. Um, it often develops alongside other mental illnesses. So the reason it was considered um, a type of OCD is because one in five up to one in four people uh, with OCD also have compulsive hoarding. Um, and it, But it can also develop alongside other mental illnesses like dementia. Uh, like schizophrenia or even uh, persistent depressive disorders. Um, and, you know, there's research linking um, the development of hoarding to things like attachment issues with uh, parents, so, uh, issues with early separation, uh, issues with uh, an early death of a, of a parent, um, potentially issues, uh, links with um, abuse, uh, so childhood abuse or trauma. Um, so the trauma could be in childhood. It could be uh, also when in adulthood with the death of a spouse, the death of a child. Um, it's been shown that that can exacerbate hoarding uh, in people. Um, and research tends to discount uh, past experience of poverty. So that used to be something that might be people might consider would lead to hoarding if you used to be poor and now you may not be or even now you still are but you have some means to acquire items um, that's generally not shown in the research to be a factor in developing hoarding so what kinds of things are generally hoarded um, well one of the most common things is uh, paper so this can include just printing paper uh, it can include mail very often. Um, sometimes it'll be open, sometimes it won't be. Um, newspapers in the past have very often been hoarded. Um, it's something that comes daily. Um, it's easily uh, purchasable. It's not too expensive. And um, there can be some sentimental value in hoarding it. But of course it gets um, excessive in people with uh, hoarding disorder. Um, other things, um, books, uh, clothing is quite common, um, and containers as well. Um, sometimes the containers actually have, you know, books and clothing inside them. Sometimes they're just by themselves. So boxes, uh, paper bags, plastic bags, that sort of thing. Um, some people will hoard, uh, garbage, um, and um, unfortunately food, uh, which will often go off, um, creating those hygiene issues. Um, and in more rare cases, uh, although unfortunately we do see some of these rare cases overrepresented in uh, TV shows and in media, um, you will see people hoard things like animals. Um, so people with uh, dozens of cats in their house. Um, maybe you've seen media of that before. Um, it's more rare than hoarding, say, paper and books, but it, it does happen. Um, and in very rare cases, even uh, waste products, uh, human waste, animal waste, that sort of thing. Um, almost always the items that are collected are far, far in excess of what can reasonably be used. So even if somebody is hoarding paper um, and books and clothing, right, those are things that we would use in normal life. Um, 
for somebody with hoarding disorder, the actual amount will be significantly over what uh, what would normally what we would normally consider uh, usable. Um, now, uh, some signs of compulsive hoarding include, um, as I said before, one of the biggest ones is difficulty getting rid of the items. Right, so it's not just having that clutter; it's not being able to let go of it or clean it or have anybody else come and touch it at all. Um, the clutter can be at home, but it can also be in the office, uh, in the car, in other spaces like storage units, um, outside of the house as well. Um, often people will lose important things, so they'll treat uh, what we might consider unimportant things like scrap paper as very important, but then they might lose things like money or uh, important bills that they have to pay in the clutter. Um, often people will also feel overwhelmed by the volume of possession, uh, of their possessions. Um, and they might feel like they've sort of taken over all their spaces, um, without necessarily, as I said before, having the insight to know that this is a mental health problem. Um, some people may report, uh, being unable to stop taking free items. Um, things like advertising flyers, or even, uh, say, free sugar packets from a restaurant. Um, they will, you know, bring those home to their, uh, to their clutter. Um, and even though, again, as I said, more often than not, people with hoarding have low insight into the fact that they have a problem, or that uh, what they are going through constitutes a mental health problem, they will still often have, for instance, embarrassment and shame at inviting family and friends over. Um, so often they will still realize that the state of their home, for instance, is uh, not normal uh, and not in a state that they would want to show others, I guess. Um, and that includes, for instance, repu uh, refusing to let people come into the home to make repairs, so even strangers, right? Um, they might have a problem with letting strangers in. Um, so, what makes it so difficult to get rid of the clutter? Um, now, some of these, again, will apply um, to some people with hoarding, and some of them won't necessarily. So, um, for a lot of people, the clutter will be very disorganized. Right? So, even though, um, as I said before, uh, hoarding is not collecting, for some people, uh, when you go into a house of somebody with hoarding disorder, even though the clutter will be everywhere, it will be neatly stacked. Um, so there will be stacks of paper, and then maybe a stack of containers, and then maybe a stack of clothing. For others, it will be everywhere. Um, There will often be quite strong, positive feelings when getting new items and quite strong, negative feelings when getting rid of items or even the thought of getting rid of items. So uh, the thought of getting new items, let's say going and getting those free advertising flyers or the sugar packets from restaurants, um, there'll be joy, there'll be delight. Um, Whereas, when considering even throwing away one piece of paper, scrap paper, or a, a newspaper from two years ago, um, there might be feelings of guilt, fear, anger at themselves, anger at others for taking that if someone else comes and tries to take it away. Um, there are often strong beliefs that items which others would consider to have little value, um, the hoarders themselves, or people with hoarding disorder, will consider those items to be quite valuable or useful. Um, so again, um, even something like garbage um, that or food that's rotten, um, if that's the case, if, if that's something that they're hoarding, somebody with hoarding disorder might consider that to actually still have some value. Um, a newspaper from two years ago, as I said before, they might consider that to still have some value, 
even though it's not um, so you know I mean we might consider a newspaper to have value if say our children are in it for winning an award if we're in it if it's uh, a day of uh, there's some important event in the world that was recorded on that day but here we're talking about um, a newspaper or a piece of paper which the vast majority of people would consider to have no value um, so the value um, that they uh, that people with hoarding disorder see is very different to what the vast majority of people would see um, often people with hoarding disorder will feel responsible um, they'll be feel responsible for items in their clutter they might feel that um, even inanimate objects in their clutter have feelings for instance that can be hurt um, by them getting rid of them or throwing them away um, and as I said before, one of the big things that makes getting rid of the clutter difficult um, is that there's often a denial of the problem. Um, even when that clutter clearly interferes with a person's life, even when that clutter is causing distress, there's often a denial from the person that there is a problem at all. Um, they can be experiencing distress and still say, my distress has nothing to do with my clutter. Um... So, what are some of the negative effects of hoarding? Now, uh, just before I go into this, um, I'm just going to put up uh, maybe a couple of uh, pictures. I'm sure a lot of you have seen what hoarding can look like, but if you haven't, uh, here's an example. So, as you can see, um, a lot of items there, books, uh, maybe some garbage in those bags, um, plastic bottles, uh, there'll be paper in there, there'll be all sorts of files perhaps. Um, and you can clearly see that this space is now um, pretty much unusable for the original intent of the space, which might be a study, it could be a uh, living room, it could even be a bedroom, perhaps. Um, this is the extent to which um, somebody with hoarding disorder might, um, might, the extent to which somebody's clutter might uh, accumulate into. Um, and Again, even trying to get rid of, say, a plastic bottle on the floor um, will often um, trigger very negative feelings of guilt, of fear, of anger. It will trigger strong beliefs that that uh, thing that maybe we would consider as having very little value is valuable to them. Um, and again, you know, they may consider those objects to have... Um, feelings or they may be they may feel like they're responsible for those objects um, so some negative effects of hoarding as you can probably imagine um, severe clutter really threatens the safety and the health of people living in the, uh, these sorts of conditions so you could have uh, structural damage you could have clutter falling on somebody um you know there have been cases where people have had to call the fire department to come in the fire department can't even get in the house um but they've been calling because maybe they've lain for a day or two underneath clutter that's fallen on them um but they've been too ashamed to actually call for help until they're um desperate um Obviously, you know, this presents a huge fire hazard as well. Um, you know, any sort of spark uh, from, let's say, a PowerPoint or that sort of thing um, could light up uh, much of, you know, much of that is quite flammable. Um, and there have been people who have died in fires, um, unfortunately, because they've been unable to get out of their house um, because of the clutter. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, sickness as well, um, you know, there's a lot of issues with people who uh, 
I mean, in those rare cases where people might hoard um, very unhygienic things like uh, human waste or um, might have, you know, dozens and dozens of animals living with them to the point where, um, you know, it makes it very difficult to clean up after them, uh, there might be a lot more increased risk of disease. Um, I'm just going to switch to a different example now. So here is another example um, of hoarding. Um, so a bit less organized, I guess. Although the other one, you know, questionable whether that was really organized. Um, but again, uh, some different items. Um, maybe not quite as uh, cluttered, but uh, again, you know, for people this builds up, right? It, the prognosis of uh, hoarding is generally chronic, which means it doesn't get better without treatment. Um, people don't just get over it. So, um, you know, this might be somebody who is, let's say, in their 40s or, or early 50s, and then, you know, you add another 20 years of hoarding onto this. If they don't seek treatment, um, that's going to look a lot worse. Um, so, other negative effects of hoarding. Um, it can lead to very expensive and emotionally devastating evictions, right? So even, you know, obviously if somebody is renting and they're a hoarder, um, as with many elderly people, perhaps, uh, you know, this is unacceptable uh, for uh, most landlords. Um, even if you do own a house, um, some people, the hoarding gets so bad that it uh, spills outside of the house. Um, and then, you know, the council might be called, um, or they may have issues with holding down a job or something and fall behind their mortgage payments. And suddenly, uh, you know, authorities or, or police or whatever it might be, get to see what kind of conditions uh, that uh, the house is in. Perhaps people have children and then, you know, you have issues with um, Department of Child Safety and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, hoarding can lead to quite um, emotionally devastating uh, actions being taken against the person. Um, and it can lead to things like homelessness as well. Um, it can lead to quite severe conflict with family members and friends. Um, often because of the low insight. So, uh, family and friends will very often get frustrated at the people who uh, at people who have hoarding disorder because um, often the denial um, in the face of what the family members and friends might think is quite obvious um, problems uh, the denial can be quite frustrating and um, the sort of perceived helplessness that friends and family might have around being able to change the situation for that person. Um, and the thing is, attempts to sort of force an intervention or uh, clean out the place without the consent of the person who has hoarding disorder almost always fail. Um, maybe in some TV shows or in some more idealistic settings uh, it's possible, but uh, it, in uh, the vast majority of cases, cleaning out clutter of somebody who has hoarding disorder without their consent often causes extreme distress. It often causes them to relapse further and have greater attachment to future clutter. Right? Um, and will usually prevent... Uh, will usually make it so that the person suffering will be much less likely to call for help in the future or um, get themselves into situations where they uh, might be forced again to have that sort of cleaning done for them basically it doesn't uh, it doesn't cleaning out the clutter doesn't address the root of the problem uh, so having said all of that um, if somebody you know, um, you know, you're concerned about uh, 
their hoarding behavior um, or if you're concerned about your own hoarding behavior perhaps um, as I said before please consult a doctor or mental health professional there is help available to address some of the more uh, root causes or at least um, some of the symptoms um, rather than uh, waiting for you know um, forced uh, decluttering or, that, or interventions from uh, outside forces. Um, please seek help if you are concerned about yourself or a loved one. So that's pretty much all I have on uh, hoarding. Um, as always, um, just to go into the disclaimer again, this talk is intended to provide information and education only. It's not meant for diagnostics, diagnosis or treatment purposes. Um, just because you're experiencing some of the symptoms doesn't mean you have um, a hoarding disorder. Um, but if you are concerned, as I said before, please seek help from a doctor or mental health professional in your area. Uh, so the next talk we'll do is probably going to be on uh, bipolar. Uh, Bipolar disorder, uh, there are two categories, bipolar 1 and 2. I may or may not actually go into the differences, but, um, you know, we, there are a not insignificant amount of people with diagnosed bipolar disorder, and there's a lot of confusion around uh, what bipolar means. Um, and I'll finish off with a quote uh, that has to do a little bit with hoarding. It's not uh, from somebody with hoarding, but I thought it was uh, relevant anyway. Um, so it's by Nicole Krauss, a, an American author. Um, and the quote is, uh, at the end, all that's left of you are your possessions. Perhaps that's why I've never been able to throw anything away. Perhaps that's why I hoarded the world with the hope that when I died, the sum total of my things would suggest a life larger than the one I lived. Maybe a little bit of insight into uh, what somebody who's hoarding might be thinking. Um, thanks as always for listening, and I will see you on the next Talk.